Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Sub-10 webinar on synchronization. Today, we are pleased to tell you all about the sync requirements for LTE and how Sub-10 Systems offers a world-beating solution for synchronization. In 2013, Sub-10 launched our new Liberator V-Band links starting with the V100 and then the new V1000 later this year. Today we're excited to tell you about the snapback Synky solution offered by these new products. As our partners and customers know, we have many Liberator links deployed all over the world. And these are just a few of the examples. As you can see from these photos, the deployments are often in dense metro areas, and this is typical of the environment for LTE small cells. This slide shows a typical small cell backhaul deployment for urban metro cells. LTE small cell base stations may be mounted on lamp posts or other street furniture. And this requires the backhaul links to be as small as possible. And this is the ideal application for the Sub-10 Liberator V-Band links. The key requirements for small cell backhaul are that the links should support at least 100 megabit per second full duplex and should be able to carry synchronization using SyncE and 1588. In addition, the links need to be compact, unobtrusive and lightweight for mounting on uh, poles and other street furniture. And they need to be priced keenly to accelerate small cell rollouts. So there is a, a trend happening whereby uh, TDM backhaul is migrating to carrier ethernet. Traditionally, uh, microwave backhaul used TDM circuits such as E1 or T1. These circuits carry a native clock signal along with the data, and so timing is already available. Backhaul networks are now migrating away from these circuits to carrier Ethernet. The main drivers for this change to carrier Ethernet are firstly the transition to IP in the core network. Secondly, increasing data requirements, which are now up to 8 or even 16 E1 circuits being needed for an LTE base station. Thirdly, uh, the E1 circuits are expensive and not easily scalable, and this means that uh, providing 8 or 16 E1 circuits is not a cost-effective op option. And finally, there is growing demand for QoS support. So these are the drivers for change. Now, um, carrier ethernet doesn't carry a native clock. Uh, it is instead packet-based, and so it needs a synchronization mechanism. This table shows you the synchronization requirements for different mobile networks. We've uh, listed GSM, UMTS, CDMA 2000, TD, SCDMA, LTE, and WiMAX. Now, each of these networks will require frequency sync, phase sync, and time sync. So uh, there will be a specification on each of these. So for example, most of the radio networks uh, require frequency synchronization with accuracies between 50 and 250 parts per billion. Uh, systems like GSM, UMTS TDD, or LTE TDD uh, have a maximum phase error in the microsecond range, and uh, some of the other systems have a maximum time error in the low microsecond range. You can see from this table that the synchronization requirements are pretty stringent. And um, the important thing to note here is that the transport 
network actually needs much tighter timing accuracy than the radio access network does. So for example, a RAN specification of 50 parts per billion uh, frequency accuracy uh, means that the transport or backhaul network needs to be accurate uh, to 16 parts per billion, which is around four times more accurate than the RAN. So this is quite a, a stringent requirement to have to meet. Uh, this slide uh, looks at uh, distributing timing in a mobile network. And what we show here is a, a core network using IP. Uh, it has an incoming primary reference clock and the uh, red striped arrows show the extent of sync E uh, permeating through the network. So for an LTE network, the sync E signal uh, can be carried all the way to the IP node B, so that's the, the LTE base station. For other networks such as GSM and UMTS, uh, a gateway is needed which takes the timing from the sync E and uh, translates that timing into a, the timing pulse in a, a TDM or an ATM line to the GSM or UMTS base station. Either way, accurate synchronization is required for all the base stations and sync E provides a robust way to achieve this synchronization. So synchronous Ethernet needs to support ITU-T G.803 synchronized networks. Um, so I'll explain a little more. So um, in a typical network, um, uh, if we look at the diagram on the left, um, there's a synchronization supply unit at the top, or SSU, and that needs to transfer its clock through the network to the SSU at the bottom. Uh, traditionally, the timing pulse can be transferred between network elements, and these are marked with the, the oval ovals with an S in them, and these are SDH network elements, which uh, have timing natively built in. There's usually a second path uh, for redundancy of the clock. Uh, if you look at the diagram on the right hand side, you'll see that on one of the paths, the SDH network elements have been replaced by packet switched network elements that support synchronous Ethernet. So the requirement here is that the Sync E devices must be able to interwork with the SSUs and the SDH network elements to carry the clock in the same way as the SDH network elements do, and so that you can. Uh, intersperse um, the different types of network elements and still be able to carry the clock. Uh, so now we look at uh, the inner workings of Sync E in a bit more detail. So Sync E provides a layer one mechanism to lock the clocks together at each end of the backhaul link. So in this diagram we have a primary reference clock coming in um, which drives the layer one clock on the left hand side and the backhaul carries a timing signal to the layer one on the other side of the network. So the synchronous Ethernet mechanism always operates at layer one. Now Sync E does also make use of layer two messages. These are SSM or sync state messages. And what these do is they carry information about the reliability of the incoming clock. So if the incoming clock that is in this diagram, the PRC, should start to drift and become unreliable, then the SSM messages will inform the slave clock uh, that this clock is no longer reliable and probably the slave clock needs to um, look for an alternative clock source. So that's the basic um, operation of synchronous Ethernet. 
And if we look in still a little more detail, um, Sync E devices typically work by regenerating the clock. So on the left hand side, there's a master device which has its own face lock loop. Um, there's an incoming reference clock. Uh, the timing is extracted, and this is kept in layer one and translated through the PHY layer to the slave device on the other side of the link. There is a clock recovery scheme and then a digital face lock loop in the slave device uh, to regenerate the clock. Now, the difficulty here is jitter or packet delay variation. And the face lock loops don't work very well when there is a lot of jitter. So what this means is that the face lock loops have to be designed with wider loop filters, and that means low loop gain and therefore very long acquisition times. So because of this, typical Sync E devices may take many minutes or even up to one hour in some cases to achieve lock. Uh, this slide um, talks about the ITU-T G.8262 specs for synchronous Ethernet. So uh, the main parameters are MTIE or mean time interval error and also TDEV uh, which is time deviation. Uh, for each of these parameters uh, there are two options or profile curves and uh, you can see that um, for both of them the timings are in nanoseconds. So these are quite stringent um, profiles to have to meet. Now some Sync E devices may claim compliance with G.8262 but in fact they may not meet the most stringent part of the timing profiles. So the sub-10 system snapback Sync E always meets the most stringent part of the timing profile. Um, for example the MTIE is less than 5 nanoseconds and the TDEV is less than 1 nanosecond. So we, we meet the 8262 specs with significant margin. So why is the snapback Sync E solution from sub-10 systems so important? So if we think about um, street level deployments uh, of small cell base stations and the necessary backhaul. Uh, it's likely firstly that the millimeter wave beams may be slightly occluded or they may even be occasionally broken by a high vehicle or other obstruction that cuts the beam. In this case we show a bus London double decker driving through the beam. Secondly the power supply to the lampposts may suffer outage due to roadworks and other maintenance. If a power outage happens, it may actually take down a whole chain uh, of backhaul links um, because the power supply may well be the same for a number of lampposts. In this case, the Sync E signal, which is required throughout the synchronized network, may actually be interrupted and it might cause outage to other nodes which weren't themselves affected by the power or data link outage. So it's very important to have a robust synchronization scheme which can keep the flow of synchronization and timing uh, for as long as possible. So then, to make uh, street-level deployments suffer as little as possible from outages, the sub-10 system snapback sync E is a great solution. It's a patent-pending technology for synchronous Ethernet. It achieves the G.8262 limits with significant margin. It maintains the synchronization signal far below the point of the data link sensitivity. So th this means it's virtually immune to fading. Also, the snapback Sync E 
can snap back into lock within 10 seconds after a power outage event. Another advantage is that devices in a chain all pull into lock together. So for example, if five radios in a chain come back after a power outage, the time taken uh, to achieve lock for all links in that chain uh, is less than 30 seconds with snapback Synky. So this is really important because the whole network depends on distribution of the Sync E clock signals. Sub 10 snapback Sync E uh, will not drop during various sorts of fade and it will re-establish Sync E clock transfer for a whole chain of devices just seconds after a power outage event. And this all acts to keep the customer's network in sync for as long as possible. Uh, lastly, a, a short piece about IEEE 1588. Uh, 1588 is a layer 2 packet-based timing scheme, uh, also known as PTP or Packet Timing Protocol. 1588 is packet-based, so it does not depend on the whole network being hardware compatible, um, which is required for synchronous Ethernet. However, since 1588 is packet-based, it's affected by network loading and packet delay variation. So the way 1588 works is that it's based on timing packets. These packets are sent out regularly through the network and they carry a timestamp um, telling all the nodes the exact time of day. Now the difficulty is that when these timing packets uh, work their way through the network, they get delayed a small amount by every network element or node that they go through. So when the timing packet egresses out of a particular node, the last thing that should happen is that the timestamp within the packet needs to be updated by adding to it the residence time uh, that it's spent in that network element. Um, these packets, these timing packets, need to have the highest priority so that they don't get delayed by other packets, but they still suffer from network loading. So to achieve the highest accuracy, 1588 should be implemented with hardware support at the lowest layer possible between the MAC and the FI layers. So if this is not done and 1588 is simply implemented on top of an existing system without this hardware support, then the results will not be as good and the, the timing accuracy will suffer. 1588 can be used both for frequency synchronization and for timing synchronization. Sub-10 systems, however, prefer to use Sync E for frequency synchronization because Sync E works at layer one and doesn't suffer the jitter or PDV problems. Sub-10 does use 1588 for time of day and transparent clock, and the 1588 works hand in hand with the synchronous Ethernet and Sub-10 believes that this is the ro most robust solution for timing. So here are the advantages of the Liberator VBAN platform with Snapback Sync E. So Liberator V100 debuts are Snapback Sync E. Snapback Sync E is resilient to all kinds of fades it can reacquire lock within seconds after a power outage event, and Sync E works together with 1588 V2. Partners and customers, please contact your trusted distributor or Sub10 sales rep, or email info at sub10systems.com. Thank you so much for joining us to hear about our world-leading Sync E solution. Thank you. <laughs>